Hello and welcome to the Wednesday, September 7th, 2022 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Cobalt Strike, while not without competition these days, is still a very popular post-exploitation command and control tool. So really nice to have DDA's 1768.py tool. It's, of course, always helpful in analyzing Cobalt Strike if you're able to capture the process on an infected machine or just get the executable. In today's diary, DDA is going over how to use the tool in, well, less than a ideal conditions if the sample that you captured was obfuscated and the tool isn't able to find the configuration. This often happens if you capture the binary. So one quick way to solve this problem is to run the malware in a sandbox, capture the memory dump, and then often you'll get the post-obfuscated uh, binary. That, of course, requires first you run the malware in a sandbox, and that's not everybody's sort of uh, thing uh, to do necessarily. It turns out that uh, in this case, there's a little bit of different method that actually worked for DDA. The executable here had a large amount of overlay data attached to it. The relatively large overlay was, however, split into many small sections. So did he figure, well, they're really too small for a stateless uh, cobalt strike uh, beacon, but there was a nice repeating pattern. So what you often have with obfuscation is sort of a simple XOR key. And when you have a repeating pattern like this, that's often some null bytes at the end uh, that uh, were uh, of course, uh, then XOR and basically just uh, reflect uh, the key. And that's what Diddy played with and was able uh, to actually then deobfuscate uh, this particular segment. And well, uh, then his tool uh, worked and was able to extract the key used by Cobalt Strike to encrypt its communication, which of course is sort of the end goal. So you can then go back to packet captures and uh, decode them. As usual for DDA, he not only walks you through how to do all of this, he also amended some of his tools to actually make it easier uh, to do some of this uh, decoding and then uh, extraction of uh, the key. And as more and more organizations implement two-factor authentication, criminals are attempting, of course, to find ways to bypass two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication does not necessarily provide phishing protection. Some two-factor authentication does, but if you just have simple one-time passwords, they don't really do this. If the attacker is able to set up a proxy and then intercept the traffic, they either get the credentials or they don't even bother with the credentials and just get whatever session token is coming back from the website the victim is trying to log into. Now, for a while now, there have been proxy servers that were essentially purpose-built uh, to uh, do this uh, kind of interception. And then you would set up a phishing site in order to trick the user into actually connecting to this proxy server. You don't want to just build a simple proxy server to the target website because then you have TLS problems, but by intercepting it using a different host name for which the attacker has the key, that's then not as obvious. Well, uh, but there's work involved. You have to get all the keys set up. You have to get the proxy set up. You have to get the phishing page configured. Attackers don't like to do work. Otherwise, they would get real jobs. So now there is a proxy as a service that specifically targets websites that support two-factor authentication like Google and Microsoft. Evil proxy is what it goes by and packages are available in uh, different formats. Uh, the one month package costs about $400. As an attacker, you're getting then a nice web-based admin interface and uh, you can connect to that via Tor. And Sykesel released a new firmware for its NAS device addressing a critical remote code execution vulnerability. Exploitation of the vulnerability does not require authentication and is 
accomplished via a crafted UDP packet. So could be spoofed possibly. It is not clear from the vulnerability notification which exact service is affected. So don't really know if it's something simple like DNS or maybe something like NFS or so that's not typically exposed on uh, these uh, devices. But Updating is probably a good idea and even better minimize your attack surface by not exposing these devices to the internet. And talking about things that should not be exposed to the internet, router admin interfaces, the latest example is described in a blog by Palo Alto's Unit 42. Palo Alto found a version of MooBot, which itself is derived from the infamous Mirai botnet. And this version of MooBot uses four different vulnerabilities to attack D-Link routers. Two of the remote code execution vulnerabilities it uses were patched this year. Remember, I mentioned this a few times before, uh, set up a calendar reminder once a month to double check that the firmware of your routers is up to date. And then as always, don't expose them to the internet. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.